thousands of rogue trawlers descending from Indonesia, plundering our rich fishing grounds. And they're so brazen about it. Police have caught the fishermen, but witnesses say the punishment is a joke. However, experts say Indonesia's oceans might be drying up. And this is all because of unsustainable fishing practices and overfishing. And China has not explicitly claimed the Natuna Islands, but has said that it has nearby fishing rights within a self-proclaimed nine-dash line, which covers most of the South China Sea, but isn't recognized internationally. Today, we delve into the complexities of oceanic resources and their management. Today, we explore the intricate dynamics surrounding fishing practices, the challenges of regulating deep sea mining, and the implications of international treaties on ocean conservation. Stay tuned as we navigate through the depths of these issues and their global significance. New Guinea, a vast island, is divided vertically by the border between Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, and horizontally by the towering Central Cordillera Range. These peaks reach such heights that they generate snow despite being just a few hundred miles from the equator. This snow melt flows into valleys, filling rivers and nourishing agriculture before ultimately feeding into the island's coastal mangrove forests. These forests thrive, serving as vital fish spawning grounds and nurturing marine life, which then migrate out to the nearby sea to mature. This sea, situated between Indonesia and Australia, is renowned for its incredibly productive fisheries. However, despite being legally divided with Australia in the southern half and Indonesia in the northern half, Indonesia historically lacked effective enforcement of fishing restrictions in these waters. In a 2001 survey, it was discovered that 85% of vessels over 50 gross tons were operating without a license, and only around 30% of the catch was being accurately reported. Conversely, on the Australian side of the sea, the north is sparsely populated, except for the city of Darwin, with small towns scattered along the coast every couple hundred miles. Consequently, the region has never supported a significant fishing industry, despite its proximity to the sea. The Northern Territory, boasting the most coastal area, has only around 147 registered fishing vessels, which seems reasonable given the circumstances. The cost of living in Australia is much higher than in Indonesia, with the GDP per capita 14 times higher on the southern side of the sea. Despite the equivalent distance from either side to Australia's populated southeast, Indonesia's fishing industry likely outcompetes on cost in the Australian market and beyond. Hence, the majority of fishing in the sea occurs within Indonesia's exclusive economic zone. While it's challenging to definitively prove, Indonesian fishers believe the Australian side is richer in fish, particularly sharks. They are correct, especially in the case of sharks, as shark fishing is rare in Australia and shark finning is strictly illegal. This illegal practice involves catching a shark, cutting off its fins, and discarding the rest of the animal, as shark fins are highly valued in Asian markets, often fetching over $1.500 per pound. To maximize profits and transportation efficiency, poachers often discard the rest of the shark's body, resulting in the deaths of dozens, even hundreds of sharks in a single expedition. Despite stringent enforcement and rare instances of shark hunting in Australia, the coastal shark populations are relatively healthy compared to those on the northern side of the sea. However, poachers exploit this knowledge, contributing to the ongoing issue. A small wooden boat departs from the small island city of Dobo, heading southward. It continues its journey south, venturing beyond Indonesia's exclusive economic zone where it is authorized to fish and into Australia's waters where it lacks such permission. Due to the sea's shallow depths and calm conditions, it successfully navigates to a collection of uninhabited islands on Australia's northern coast. These remote islands offer an isolated location for the fishermen to establish a camp on Australian soil, spending their days searching through the surrounding bays and thinning shark populations. This activity is completely illegal. They lack the legal right to fish, especially in this manner, and to set foot on Australian territory. However, there is little chance they will face consequences. 
Although the Australian Navy patrols the coast, the vast and desolate nature of the area works in favor of the Indonesian fishermen. Even if they are apprehended, punishment can only be administered if Navy personnel successfully board the Indonesian boat. However, the fishermen often refuse to stop and instead accelerate northward towards the border between Australian and Indonesian waters. It could take hours or even days, but once they cross that line, Australians are powerless to intervene. Aware of the risks of attempting to board a small boat with sharp obstacles at high speed, the Navy may decide to abandon the chase long before reaching that boundary. While arrests do occur and are increasing in number, it is understood that these represent only a small fraction of the total incursions into Australian waters. Thus, Australia's well-protected fish stocks are being depleted, but it is foreign vessels rather than the Indonesian fishermen who are ultimately responsible for this decline in the fishery. According to the illegal, unreported, and unregulated IUU Fishing Index, which assesses countries and regions based on their susceptibility to illegal fishing practices, Indonesia ranks 20th globally. However, its Pacific neighbors fare even worse in this regard. Japan ranks 12th, South Korea 3rd, and Russia 2nd. Topping the list is China, which not only leads the IUU fishing index, but also hauls in the highest fish tonnage year after year, boasting the largest fishing fleet in the world. This sets the stage for widespread overfishing on a global scale. China's voracious appetite for marine resources began to burgeon in the 1980s, coinciding with a steady increase in personal income that has yet to significantly slow down. By 2000, China's domestic fish catch had quadrupled, pushing its fisheries to the brink of collapse. Consequently, both state planners and struggling boat captains turned their sights to foreign and disputed waters, sometimes legally and other times not. In response to its own fisheries decline, Indonesia attempted to deter foreign fleets from entering its waters in 2014. Vessels caught engaging in illegal fishing were publicly destroyed at sea as a show of force. Despite these efforts, Chinese vessels numbered in the hundreds were identified across Indonesian waters, overwhelming the resources of the cash-strapped nation. With their seas depleted, Indonesian fishers redirected their efforts towards Australia. The impact of China's vast, unregulated fishing fleet extends far beyond the Western Pacific. China is home to the world's largest distant water fleet, comprised of vessels capable of crossing oceans rather than merely hugging coastlines. The exact size of this fleet remains uncertain, with some reports suggesting thousands of vessels, while more recent estimates place the number at around 17,000. By comparison, the U.S. distant water fleet consists of only 300 boats. This massive Chinese armada has not only exacerbated problems in the Asia-Pacific region, but has also exported them worldwide. Take West Africa, for example. Along the coastal ridge from Mauritania to Sierra Leone, Chinese companies have been acquiring fishing licenses and operating since the mid-1980s. However, in the past decade, African governments and Chinese fishing companies have reached a critical point. Countries have offered specific cash quotas to fishing companies to safeguard the nation's fish stocks. Yet local fishing communities have observed a concerning depletion of fish. In Senegal, where one-fifth of the population works in fishing and around 85% of protein intake comes from fish, this depletion has led to job losses and genuine food shortages. The issue isn't merely due to the over-allocation of fishing licenses, but also because Chinese ships report only a minuscule 8% of their actual catch along the African coasts. Senegal, at times, has stopped issuing fishing licenses to foreign boats. However, this action is limited in its effectiveness, as countries like Senegal lack the naval resources or satellite tracking capabilities to enforce such moratoriums. Even when boats comply with fishing freezes, they can simply relocate operations to the edges of Senegal's exclusive economic zone or into international waters, continuing to fish unabated. Distant water fleets are wreaking havoc on fisheries worldwide, 
showing little regard for national or international regulations. In the Pacific, tracking services have followed Chinese fleets into North Korean waters, potentially explaining why fragments of Korean ships have mysteriously washed up on Japanese beaches. Local fishers find themselves unable to compete in their waters, now dominated by Chinese ships, forcing them to venture farther out to sea where their small boats face rough conditions and crews risk their lives. Furthermore, moving into exclusive economic zones, EEZs, constitutes another blatant disregard for rules, as Chinese vessels ignore UN sanctions prohibiting fishing in North Korean waters while depleting North Korea's fish population. This pattern repeats on the high seas, where international laws are less stringent. Chinese fishing armadas have gained the ominous nickname Dark Fleets as they frequently disable their AIS tracking systems for extended periods, enabling them to enter EEZs, fish, and then retreat to international waters undetected. This practice also facilitates the laundering of catches, as smaller fishing vessels transfer their haul onto larger transport ships, obscuring the origin of the catch and allowing for the disposal of low-grade fish or illegal catches an activity known as transshipment. Although sneaking into EEZs and unauthorized transshipment is illegal, proving guilt requires substantial evidence. Catching companies in the act and apprehending the boats are both costly and challenging tasks in the vastness of the ocean. The cycle persists. Small operators catch fish illegally in prohibited areas while large operators exceed fishing quotas or target prohibited species, then covertly process their catch through shipping vessels. As a result, one out of every five fish consumed is caught illegally. This relentless efficiency of the fishing industry is driving ocean resources to the brink of collapse. However, the threats to our oceans extend beyond dwindling fish populations. The ocean holds valuable treasures not just for sustenance, but also for potential healing properties. While traditional medicine has long utilized marine organisms, modern medicine is increasingly recognizing their therapeutic value. For example, halivin, derived from a Japanese sea sponge, generates over $300 million in annual sales and extends the lifespan of late-stage breast cancer patients. Another drug, Prealt, sourced from the venom of sea-based cone snails, effectively treats severe chronic pain without the drawbacks of opioids. Moreover, numerous marine-based drugs are currently undergoing clinical testing. This trend mirrors the use of compounds from terrestrial plants and animals for medicinal purposes, yet the ocean's biodiversity surpasses that of land. The majority of Earth's biodiversity resides in the ocean, with numerous undiscovered species that hold potential for drug development. Despite its immense potential, the ocean remains vastly unexplored. Only about 10% of marine species are estimated to have been discovered. However, advancements in submersible technology and the decreasing costs of sample testing and study are making marine exploration more accessible, offering promising prospects for discovering new medicinal compounds and preserving our oceanic ecosystems. DNA sequencing has become increasingly affordable over the years. In 2001, it cost over $5,000 to sequence a million bases of DNA, but today the cost has plummeted to almost half a cent. Despite this, the utilization of marine genetic resources remains largely limited to niche drugs. However, there is an anticipation that ongoing exploration and research may unveil groundbreaking compounds for treating common illnesses, potentially sparking a pharmaceutical boom in the world's oceans. Meanwhile, another significant opportunity lies on the horizon, polymetallic nodules scattered across the ocean floor. These potato-sized clumps contain valuable metals, such as manganese, zinc, cobalt, copper, and nickel, making them an enticing prospect. With the increasing demand for these metals, particularly for building wind turbines, electric car batteries, and other components of a decarbonized grid, deep-sea mining is gaining attention as a potentially low-cost, low-impact source compared to land-based mining. However, there are opposing views. 
Critics argue that collecting these nodules at scale would require significant disruption to the seabed, leading to the destruction of marine habitats and the disturbance of surrounding sea life due to sediment blooms. Moreover, the ocean floor stores substantial amounts of carbon, raising concerns that mining activities could release this carbon into the atmosphere, offsetting any environmental benefits. As of now, commercial-scale ocean floor mining has yet to commence. The International Seabed Authority, ISA, a UN body tasked with regulating deep-sea mining activities, has only issued 31 exploratory licenses for small-scale tests. However, a significant change may be imminent due to a specific provision outlined in the 1994 agreement relating to the implementation of Part 11 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. This provision stipulates that if an ISA member nation intends to commence deep-sea mining operations, the authority has two years to establish regulations governing such activities. On July 9, 2021, Nauru initiated this two-year countdown. As of July 9, 2023, the ISA has failed to establish rules for deep-sea mining, effectively allowing Nauru and all member nations to potentially initiate operations without any environmental restrictions. Since the ISA regulates international waters, Nauru would act as a facilitator rather than conducting operations in its waters. Partnered with the Metals Company, based in Canada, Nauru would submit a license application to the ISA on behalf of the company. Larger governments like Canada may hesitate to be perceived as endorsing environmentally destructive practices, hence the involvement of smaller nations like Nauru. Once an application is submitted, it undergoes review by the ISA's Legal and Technical Commission to assess compliance with non-existent regulations. However, a subset of members contends that the absence of regulations should not prevent the Commission from recommending approval, leading to potential legal disputes within the authority. Furthermore, the ISA is divided on the issue of deep-sea mining, with some advocating for regulated mining, while others push for a moratorium or outright ban due to environmental concerns. Moreover, approximately 30 nations are not members of the ISA, and are therefore not bound by its regulations. Notably, the United States Senate declined to ratify the treaty that would have led to ISA membership, citing concerns that the authority might restrict deep-sea mining activities. Consequently, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has issued exploratory licenses to American companies, despite lacking recognition by the ISA. This could result in a confrontation between the UN and the US if companies use American backing as legal justification for their international operations. The future of deep-sea mining remains uncertain, but the need for systematic management of resources in international waters is becoming increasingly apparent. The Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty, also known as the Treaty of the High Seas, finalized its draft at the UN headquarters on March 4, 2023, marking a significant milestone after nearly two decades of negotiations. This treaty addresses a crucial aspect that had been overlooked in previous agreements concerning international waters and natural resources. It establishes a framework for the sharing of access to marine genetic resources, including samples, data, and sequencing among countries. Additionally, it mandates environmental impact assessments for activities on the high seas that may be deemed potentially harmful to the environment. Moreover, it lays the groundwork for the creation of marine protected areas where all resource harvesting is strictly prohibited. However, some concerns have been raised regarding the treaty's scope, particularly its exclusion of activities already regulated by bodies like the International Seabed Authority, ISA, which oversees deep sea mining. China has been firm in its stance on this issue throughout the negotiations. Nevertheless, many view the treaty as a significant step forward in addressing immediate threats to ocean environments and potentially altering the future of the oceans. Despite the agreement on the draft in March, formal adoption occurred later on June 20, 2023, 
at the UN Intergovernmental Conference. The treaty is expected to open for signatures in September and will become law two months after the 60th country ratifies it. With major players like the EU, US, and China involved in the negotiations, it is anticipated that all significant actors in international waters will ratify the treaty eventually. However, concerns remain about the effectiveness of international treaties, as they often prioritize individual state interests and can be undermined by political considerations. The Paris Agreement serves as an example, with countries adjusting their emissions cuts and even withdrawing from the agreement entirely to suit their interests. Enforcement of international treaties can also be challenging, especially when conflicting with a nation's immediate interests or favoring one nation over another. Thus, while the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Treaty represents a significant step, its success will depend on effective enforcement mechanisms and international cooperation. In simple terms, the United Nations lacks a navy, and the oceans are vast beyond comprehension. Nations have struggled to protect their exclusive economic zones from poaching, let alone regulate the open seas. While there may be agreement on paper, the success and impact of the treaty will ultimately depend on enforcing compliance and regulating activities on the high seas. The prospect of unregulated deep sea mining feels like an existential threat, potentially altering the last pristine areas untouched by human hands. However, this threat is already a reality. The shift from small scale to industrial fishing has devastated the oceans, with a third of global fish stocks overfished and another 60% fished at unsustainable rates. Very few fish stocks are growing globally, and these trends are worsening. There is a significant economic incentive for individual actors to continue overfishing, perpetuating the tragedy of the commons. While this problem can be addressed at the national level, finding a long-term solution internationally remains elusive. As technology advances, similar challenges may arise in other areas, including outer space, where asteroid mining poses legal and environmental dilemmas akin to deep-sea mining. The world must utilize diplomacy to foster cooperation and consensus for the greater good. As global issues transcend national boundaries, solving current problems such as overfishing is paramount before addressing future challenges. By addressing present issues, we lay the groundwork for solving future ones. Thank you for joining us on this insightful exploration of the challenges facing our oceans, from overfishing to the prospect of deep-sea mining, which requires urgent attention and international cooperation.